Hag Sameach. Happy holidays. And I also like this version. Can you see it? Happy holidays. <laughs> I was gifted this last year at the end of Hanukkah. I hardly got to wear it. I'm enjoying this year. <laughs> so thank you. Tada. Oops. Oops. My tablet went upside down. Hold on just a second. It twists every which way, but I, you know, some learn to read Hebrew upside down, sideways, whatever way they were in accordance with the scroll. They learned to read Hebrew that way, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've had a wonderful time rejoicing, and I agree to have the joy of youth with us tonight. It's such a blessing to see her enthusiasm, and, and Tony, you're a great teacher. Well, it's so. makes me feel just like a child. It brings out the childness, doesn't it? And, and we all have that child in us. We, we, don't, we should never leave, lose that. Um, but uh, it... it, it <coughs> It is a family celebration. It really is. Hanukkah is a fun time. Not all of our holidays or holy days do we get to just really enjoy. This is one we enjoy, and it is centered very much around the family. Uh, I want to share just a bit of the history first, and then I will tell you how the family celebrates it. I'm trying to get uh, some things in order here so that I can flow smoothly. Uh, but uh, Bruce gave us the Brita Hadashah, Yochanan, uh, where we have Yeshua celebrating Hanukkah. But I want to go back a little bit further in history before that time. And if I were to have asked you, if you hadn't jumped in and, and done our Brita Hadashah, if I had asked you where do we find Hanukkah and how to keep it according to the scriptures, where do we find it in, in our Tanakh? And of course, the answer is it's not there. It is one of our holidays, one of our holy days is the name that, that holidays comes from. But how do we find it then if it's not mandated to us along with the others that we find mostly in Viacra in Leviticus? Well, the reason why it is not there is because it hadn't happened yet. In history, it comes between the testamental periods. That means that our Tanakh was closed. It had been written and not yet had started the recordings that we call the Berlachat Shah. That is why we don't find it there. Yet, we do find God's stamp of approval on it because if anyone wonders if it's authentic, if anyone wonders if we should be celebrating it when it's not mandated to us, well, we need look no further than to see that Yeshua was celebrating it. When it says that he walked in Solomon's colonnade or Shlomo's portico or whatever words yours has, in the English it loses it. But for those of us with a Jewish background, we know that's where they gathered to do the celebrating. So it telling us that he was at the temple and he was in this area was uh, telling us he was celebrating the Feast of Dedication. So if he put a stamp of approval on it, I think we could put our stamp of approval on it also. But let me give you just a bit of history because it took place for the first time in approximately 165 B.C. If I back up a little bit more than that, go back to 336 BC with me, and you have a name that's familiar to the Jewish and the Gentile world, and that is Alexander the Great. We know that he came into power as a world emperor in 336, and he was very high-minded. He was a, a cultured emperor, and he used Greek civilization to unite a vast array of nations under him. He allowed them to bring in their cultures, but he also laid down a foundation that was the Greek culture, Greek is the language. He brought the greatest library size-wise, the biggest library, um, the, the works of all the nations together into Alexandria. And it's somewhere in the time period, in the first, second century BC, somewhere in there, or possibly even up to the third century BC, that we have our Septuagint which was the Greek translation of the Tanakh. It was the Hebrew scriptures put into Greek. He uh, was pushing forward this, this common language and the, the common culture, so much so that we come into a period of time when we have uh, what became known as Hellenistic Jews. 
These were Jewish people who were speaking Greek. They went on so much into the Greek culture, many of them lost their Jewish flavor. They, they lost and forgotten their traditions, and there became an, almost an abandoning of the traditional way. So there were those who called themselves Hellenists and followed with that, but then the traditionalists came up also during this time and held on to that Jewishness and kept passing it down. Children are very important to us because we pass it down and we pass it down and we see that through all of our holy days, incorporating and teaching the children. Well, time passes, and Alexander the Great dies, and he was so great an emperor that no one could step into his shoes fully and keep control of the entire world. So as history tells us, his kingdom was divided up into four empires. We're going to look at one of those four who came out, and this would be the one, and if I say his name wrong, forgive me, I don't know my correct pronunciation, I don't know whose is correct, but I say Antiochus, because that's easy for us to hear and understand. Antiochus IV had the throne, so to speak, he had the control of the area in Syria. You have your Seleucids in Syria, you had your Ptolemies in Egypt. If I drew you a very simple map, I would put Syria up north, I would put Egypt down south, and what's right in between? Israel. Still is. And it still is. <laughs> always is and always will be. And if you see any map without the name Israel on it, it is wrong. It is false. Get rid of it. But we won't go political now, will we? <laughs> and Titus deified himself. He looked upon himself as a god and he wanted the people to look at him like a god and so he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means God made manifest. You will hear people say today, oh I had an epiphany and usually they're speaking to something religious. This is where the word comes from. I love our Hebrew people. They had a better name. They took it close but they brought what I think was more truth and they called him Alexander Epiphanes. And this word meant the mad one. And I think it fit him well. He was embroiled in wars with Egypt. There was a, a war in, in 169 BC. There was another war in 168 BC. And there was a power struggle going on for control of Jerusalem. Is there anything new under the sun? We still have a power struggle going on, a fight over who gets to be in total control of Jerusalem. Yet God told us. He put his name on it and he gave it to the Jewish people and it should be undivided and it belongs to Israel. Again, though, we won't go into the political side, but I have to say what, I have to get on my sandbox a little bit. <laughs> but uh, he, he would, uh, when he was in control, and he was fighting for that control, he felt that he had won the right to even enter the Holy of Holies. He, would take, he did take most of the treasures out of the temple, took them for himself, and on his second expedition, going down through Israel into Egypt, he wanted to take control of Egypt also. I think he was trying to be like Alexander the Great. But Rome was rising at this time, and Rome was not about to let this person from Syria, from that area, take control of Egypt. And Rome basically drew the line. In fact, if I use it the way that we are told from our historical books, you've heard the expression to draw a line in the sand, and it's believed it comes from this time. Because uh, and I have to look to get my name right, Gaius Popelius Olenus, I'm not sure how to say it. He met uh, Antiochus, this is now 168 BC, and he told Antiochus that the Roman Senate was ordering him to stop his attack on Egypt and to, to leave, to go back to where he came from, which would be Syria. Well, Antiochus had a bit of an attitude. Remember, he thinks he's a god, and he basically said he'd think it over. He'd discuss it with his council, and then he'd get back to Papilus. I don't know how to say this name. I'm sorry? Just say Gaius. Just say Gaius. Okay. Get that, that he would get back to Gaius with it. Well, Gaius had an answer for that, and he drew a circle around Antiochus in the sand, and told him 
that if he did not give the Roman Senate his answer before crossing that line in the sand, that Rome would declare war on him. So Antiochus had no choice but to withdraw in defeat according to the request from Rome. Went back up into his home area of Syria, but he took his anger out on Israel at this time. And where he had uh, put some control in, now he put complete control. He uh, stopped Shabbat practices at all. If you were caught keeping the Shabbat, you were put to death. He brought in foreigners into the military. He changed the names of the cities. Acre became Antioch at this time. If you uh, tried to study the Torah, if you were found with the scroll, again, you were put to death. He burned all the scrolls that he could find. Um, I think one of the worst he did for the people, too, is circumcision was forbidden. And if you remember that if they were, did not circumcise their child, this child would not be a part of the commonwealth of Israel and would be outside of the blessings of God. So this was severe because he's now inflicting not just on this generation but the upcoming. And it was at this time also that he put in the temple an image. Uh, most of the books agree that it was to Zeus, it doesn't matter, it was to a false god. Slew a pig on the altar took the broth from that, sprinkled it all over the other artifacts that were there, just desecrated it in every way he could, and was forcing the Jewish people to do likewise. They were to go to other altars, they were to also slay pigs, they were to eat the meat, which was non-kosher, and something that, that the, the priests were literally choking to death on this. Horrible, horrible time. You may ask yourself, well, why did they tolerate this? Why did they allow this? It was because they were outnumbered. The Syrian army that came in that took control was 10,000. And Israel was very small. And in the beginning, there was a Hasidic re revolt. Uh, Has the Hasidim from this time, we carry that name down to the Hasidic Jewish people today. So you know there are ultra-religious Jewish people. And we had a joke in my house that when it came to doing some work around the house, handyman type work, that my dad made a great preacher. <laughs> well, the, Has, ha, the Hasidic made great preachers, but they didn't make great warriors. And the little rebellions that they tried pretty much went down in defeat. But in Modin, very close to Jerusalem, there was a, a priest by the name of Mattathias. He is the, the famous one that you know about, but if you listen to my story, his last name was not Maccabee. Do you all know that? That Maccabee was not the last name. I like to bring that out because you hear it all the time. Oh, Judah Maccabee. And, you know, but it, it wasn't his name. Let me tell you how that came about. Mattathias saw one of his Jewish compatriots starting to sacrifice and to bow down to this false altar and in a fit of rage he actually killed the Jew. Sadly so, but he did. He fled into the mountains because he realized what he had done was wrong. His sons went with him. He had five sons. He was older. In a short time he does pass away and his son Judah is the head of the family now and he along with his brothers and a few others I did have some wisdom when it comes to war. They knew some guerrilla war tactics, and they were able, because they had the lay of the land, they knew Israel like the back of their hand, and the Syrian army coming from Syria did not know the area. So they began to set traps, and they'd lead the army in to be like chasing after them, but they'd lead them into dead ends. They'd lead them into uh, caves that had no exits, and they were able to fight against the Syrian army. I think the biggest difference, though, is they went in with a battle cry. That battle cry is how we get that name Maccabee. This comes from the book of Shemot, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11. And I believe that they picked that because this is very close in relation to the time of Passover when our Jewish people had, were threatened by the Egyptian army. And here is what it says. In our Hebrew, it's Micha Macha Ba'alim Yehovah. If you take the first letter off of each of those Hebrew words, you have the mem, the chet, the bet, and the, well, it's a Y sound. We don't have Y, but the Yehovah, the Y sound. 
and the MKBY, they took and made the word Maccabee from that. But what do we see? They went in the name of their God. Because this verse in English says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? And I believe as they raised that banner, calling on the name of the one true and living God of Israel, the same name that we later read, little David goes up against big Goliath in the name of his God, and he rocks a giant to sleep. Well, God allowed, I guess that was before this time, sorry, I said after, but David came before. Anyway, um, I believe God honored the fact that they were crying out to him, looking to him, and with God on their side, they were victorious. They started to push the, the Syrian army out of the Jerusalem area, out of the Judean hills, and eventually the little number of Israeli army beat back the 10,000s of the Syrian troops, and they have control of their land once again. That's exciting, and that's our history behind it, but there's a little more to it, because as soon as they had the control in Jerusalem, they wanted temple worship back. And the temple has really just about been completely destroyed. Everything desecrated. They even took out the altar, the rocks that were there that had formed that altar. They took it out and they started again. Now, we have a story passed down to us. Some say it's true and some say it's not. I'm going to give you um, the, the story and you can decide on your own. But uh, um, I love the story. It is said that as they were cleaning up that temple, and by the way, they had worked on the temple before they worked on their own homes. They wanted God's place first. God was first in their lives. And the story is told that they found one little cruise of olive oil that would be used to light the eternal light that Viagra, Leviticus tells us is to always be burning in the temple. That little cruise still had that priestly seal on it, so it was still considered kosher. It had not been desecrated by Antiochus and his men. And it would burn for one day, about a 24-hour period. To make the oil kosher and ready for the, the lighting that would keep it, it lit, keep the menorah lit in the temple, it would take eight days. And here's where our miracle is told, that miraculously that little cruise of oil that should have only lasted one day. And by the way, they started it even knowing the light would go out, but they just wanted to show God their intent to do it right, the way God had commanded. And the story is told that that little cruise lasted the whole eight days, that the light never went out, and the new oil was poured in, and the light kept burning. If that be true, then we know that from the, the year following and on, that is why we celebrate the eight nights of Hanukkah, that's why we celebrate with lighting candles. We light one more every night, which shows the miracle got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're, we're um, remembering and revering the light that was so important to represent God to the people. Now, if it is not true, and you ask me, well, then how did we get eight days? Why do we do this? You know, we love our traditions. The other side that, that does not want to believe that story says that because these were Hasidic, they knew the holy days, they knew what they should have been keeping all along and had not been able to under Antiochus' tyranny. And so the last holy day that they had missed was Sukkot. Sukkot also is eight days. Sukkot also was celebrated around the temple rededication in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. The, when they came back from captivity, they celebrated Sukkot in relation to rededicating the temple that they had rebuilt in that time. So rebuilding a temple, eight days, the last holy day that they just missed, they picked up that tradition and they put it into place. Either way, whether it's a miracle of oil or not, it is a miracle that the Israeli army won their freedom back. It is a miracle that the Jewish people were not wiped off the face of the map. Remember I said if you see a map without the name Israel there, it's not a good map. There are those today who make maps who do not put the name Israel there and who do not want to see the Jews survive today. They are still trying to push Israel off the face of the map. They will not prevail any more than Antiochus did because our God said there will never be an end to Israel.
So whether we celebrate for eight days on the basis of just the rededication of the temple, or whether we celebrate for a cruise of oil that lasted eight days, I don't think it much matters. We're celebrating the hand of God that gave victory to our Jewish people. We're celebrating that the light has been brought back in. And when we go to look at our menorah and we look at the light, we look at the meanings of the days, I believe that we are going to see that there is a beautiful picture here once again, like we see in so many of our holy days, of the one who is the light of the world. By the way, we do have in Don Daniel, in Daniel 11, we had a prophecy telling of this one who would come. But it also has a greater meaning and is warning of another who will come, who will do much the same thing, who will put an image in the temple and demand worship to go to him. When that day comes, our Jewish people are going to be fleeing for their lives once again. And yet, at the end of that battle, we see the one that we know as Yeshua, the one that we know as Messiah, come back in his glory with the light not shielded, not hidden, but where the whole world will see the light of the coming of the, this one who will put an end to the enemies of Israel. And on the very of the mountain of olives will put his feet the mountain will cleave and long story short a new temple will be set up temple worship will return and it will worship the god of israel it's a beautiful ending we can't wait to see it in all its glory but that's that part is still yet to be fulfilled but as I said, as we look at our days, we see that uh, there is meaning given to our days. And what I will be sharing with you tonight is the meaning as it's been passed down to me. I say that because if you listen to other rabbis, you, I'm not a rabbi, but you listen to rabbis who give us um, our, uh, teach us our history, you will find little differences. You know, if you have three Jews, you've got four opinions. <laughs> we all know that. It doesn't much matter. Again, this isn't biblically mandated where we know, but I believe overall that they, they maybe put the days in a little different order, but overall we come out pretty close to the same. And I love the meaning that was passed down to me. It does come from my father, from his traditions. He was born into Orthodox Judaism, so to me it has an air of authenticity right there. And uh, I believe that you will enjoy seeing the meaning of it also. I need to tell you one other thing before we light the candles. I'm looking to see. I think I told you everything else that I need to tell you. But each of these days, as I mentioned, you're going to see has a meaning. Uh, but as you know, if you've lit the menorahs, and if you don't know, the Shamish candle is a little bit higher than all of the other candles. This is a Hanukkah. It's not just a menorah. It is a Hanukkah. Very easy to tell the difference. In the temple, the menorah was a seven-branch candlestick. It had the one in the middle, and then it had three on each side, a total of seven. All one piece, the middle feeds the others, but it had a place for seven. When we celebrate Hanukkah, we're going to celebrate eight days. We're going to use one candle called the shamash candle. That means servant in Hebrew. We're going to use the serving candle to serve to light the other days. And so there's always one that's raised just a little bit higher than all the other days so that we distinguish that difference. But if you're looking at a menorah in a window and you don't know whether it's a Hanukkah or a menorah, it's easy. Just count the number of spaces for the candles or the lights, the oil, whatever is being used, and you'll know. So what we uh, notice right away is, as I've already mentioned, this is called a servant candle. Now, I believe, and I'm going to tip my hand because I think it's easier to see the whole picture if you're with me on the same page from the beginning. I believe that we are going to see a picture of our Messiah in this. He spoke to the world of his day, and he said, I am. As soon as I stop right there, every Jewish mind should have gone back to Moshe's day, back to the burning bush, and hearing that voice when Moshe asked, who do I say sent me? You say, I am. Then we see in our bread Chadashah, we see other uh, adjectives or nouns put onto that, I am 
Uh, simply to just give you one idea, I am the bread of life. And we see that, that he talks about being the bread come down out of heaven that feeds all who are hungry. And this that fits with our Hanukkah celebration, we hear him say in Yohanan John, chapter 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. Hanukkah is all about the light. It is the Feast of Dedication, the Festival of Lights, it's the rededication of the Temple. Remember the light in the Temple, it all focuses around the light. And lest I forget to tell you later, our Jewish people, as I said, it's a family celebration. They gather around the Hanukkah each night, they light one more candle each night, each candle will burn all the way down, I'll explain that as I'm going. They sing songs, and they're fun songs. The kids play dreidel, which is like a top game. They spin it. They're playing for Hanukkah gelt. Ooh, chocolate money. <laughs> Yum. And depending on what letter pops up, they either get some of the pot or they have to give some of the chocolate. And they play whatever rules they set. Either they play a certain amount of time and who has the most wins, or when the pot gets empty by one, that one wins. It doesn't much matter. The idea is to have fun. But these tops also have a special meaning. And you may wonder, how did a top get into the middle of our Hanukkah celebration? The letters on each side stand as an acronym, and it stands for A Great Miracle Happened There. Now that's an American dreidel. If you buy it in Israel, it literally has a different acronym that stands for A Great Miracle Happened Here. So if you want to know whether you have an Israeli or an American dreidel, you can look at the letters and know which you have. And again, they would spin this and play. But how did that become part of our story? Remember when I said that Antiochus declared if you were found with a Torah scroll, you were put to death, the scrolls were burned? Well, of course, the, the, the religious Jews valuing those scrolls, as I brought out to you before, that it's like a living soul to them. When they are so worn they cannot be used, they are given a burial. So obviously they didn't want the scrolls burned or desecrated in any way and they hid it as many as they could, as quickly as they could in some of the caves. And then they would sneak out to go study out there because remember they can't study in the temple. They can't study in their, what we call today, their yeshiva. They had to find places that they could hide and study. And of course, as they're studying in these nooks and crannies and hills and, and wherever they could find, the Syrian army would be marching through. They would be looking for those who are defecting to put them to death. So if they heard the Syrian army approaching, they had made out of clay little, what looks like little tops. And they would act like they were playing a game. They'd be spinning this, this little toy and gambling for whatever that they had. What they had done is when they heard them approaching, they hit the scrolls, pulled out the dreidels, and acted like they're just playing a gambling game. The soldiers would go on. Once they went on, they pulled out the scrolls again and went back to their study. And this is where, as I mentioned earlier, that, that we're told that some learned to read Hebrew upside down, some learned to read it sideways because they would get all the way around that precious scroll that they still had to study the Word of God. So that's why they bring that in to part of the story and then they, they love to eat we all love to eat i think that's our every one of our holidays is around food <laughs> and they do uh, they fry foods in oil to remember the oil that's why they eat what we call potato latkes a lot like a potato pancake but better <laughs> and we eat uh, jelly filled donuts that are fried in oil sukhaniot for the, the plural name of it um, and there are other traditions that they bring in, but you can see the kids love Hanukkah. If the family can afford it, they do give gifts. Because, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, the day of rededication of the temple was the 25th of Kislev. Because that sounds a lot to people like the 25th of December and the time comes close on the calendar and the giving of gifts, that they'll say, oh, this is a Jewish Christmas. Well, no, it's not a Jewish Christmas. The closest it gets to being right about that is it is a celebration about the same one. The Jewish uh, celebration about the light, and I'm telling you who the light represents, and for those who are celebrating Christmas, the true meaning of it is to be celebrating the birth of the child that was given, the son that was 
I'm sorry, the child that was born, the son that was given according to Yeshaya, Isaiah 9, 6. But that's where the similarity ends. Otherwise, the two are not related to each other at all. Um, I don't know if Janet and uh, Bruce remember Les, Les and Sally. Do you remember them? Do you remember the story Les would tell about when he was a little boy? I've got to tell his story real quick, and I love this. He was about eight or nine years old, and his mom's right there when he's telling the story. She's helping him tell it. He had gone down to play at a little friend's house, and this little friend was a Gentile boy. He had a big Christmas tree. They had gifts under the tree, much like you can see over here. And this little boy was very quick to take Les over and show Les and tell him all about how we celebrate Christmas and we get, you know, we have lights all over our tree and we have all these gifts and look, this is mine and this is mine and he's pointing out all these gifts that he was excitedly looking forward to opening on December 25th. Well, Les went home like any little eight-year-old boy would do and said, Mama, Mama, I want to celebrate Christmas. Well, Sally was smart enough to know what had happened. And she realized that he had seen presents and a tree and all of that excitement. She says, come here, Les. Let me tell you. Those Christians, they have one day. And they celebrate one day and they have a nice time and there's nothing wrong with that. But we Jewish people, we celebrate eight days. And you know what? This year you're going to get a gift every single night for eight days. And when we celebrate light, we celebrate with the Hanukkah, and we celebrate the oil, and we're going to eat foods and sing songs, and we're going to have a party eight nights in a row. Well, the next day when Les and his little friend were playing together, and they were over at Les's house, Les told his little friend all about Hanukkah. And guess what his little friend did? Went home, Mama, Mama, I want to celebrate Hanukkah. <laughs> So that's the closest the two get to relation, <laughs> to relate to each other. But again now, as we look at the meaning behind this, as we see that this servant candle, and I believe represents well, the one who we call the light of the world, the one who said that's who he was, uh, I think also is interesting to note, very likely when he said, and I read the whole verse, I am the light of the world, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I believe that he was drawing on Yeshia, on Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 9 and verse 2, where it said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. I believe it was um, prophetically speaking of the coming light, the one who now was saying to them, I am that light. I am the light of the world. It's recorded for us also by Matthew in our first book in our Brittach written by Jewish Matthew, chapter 4 and verse 16. Again, you can read it on your own, but saying that people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. Now, in fact, I'll read it for you. Those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. I believe the light did come into the world. When Yeshua chose to say this, we don't know exactly what time it was. It could have been Hanukkah time. If it were so, at this time, they had a 75-foot tall menorah that was burning in the court of the women on the hilltop of the temple overlooking Yerushalayim. That Hanukkah would burn all night long. And by the time they had eight nights aglow, it was a light that could be seen all around. A constant reminder to the Jewish population of the importance of the light of this holy day. If it were not that time, the other time that, that it could have been was again Sukkot. Sukkot, they had four 75 foot tall menorahs burning in the, the court of the women. And again, all night long, the example that it would have been, the light that was shed out. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, go see. If you haven't, go at night to see the walls around Jerusalem with the light on them. You know why it's called Jerusalem the Golden. Light it takes on a special aura and a special meaning there. And if it were either one of these times, you could see how Yeshua could have even pointed to that menorah, that Hanukkah. Or, or menorah, depending on 
which it was, but pointing to it and using that as the object lesson for the people. Tehillim, Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. And with that in mind, keep that in mind as we take our servant candle. And, you know, I took my matches down for us to light the others. Could someone bring me a little box of matches, please? I, I didn't realize that I should have uh, brought it back up. I apologize. Thank you very much. We're going to light by our servant candle and give the meaning to those days. We'll go through it. Uh, quickly, thank you. Those who are with me in person, I can give you papers that have the, the days and the, the scriptures that I'm going to give. But if you're not here, we'll try to work something out if you want you know, it. Uh, because I may go a little too fast for you to write them down completely. But uh, we take on the very first night, we light our first candle. It's always lit by our servant candles. So we actually start with two candles. And we always start on the right, and uh, can't get enough of my sticky stuff. There we go. And we light the first. I'm doing this especially for those who couldn't see on Zoom earlier when we lit our menorahs for tonight, because we're on day two tonight. And so, oh, Jenna's going to come help me. Okay, then I'll let you light. No, no, I'm going to no. hold it. I'm just going to hold it. Oh. Okay, well, so that you don't have to Okay. We light by the light of the servant candle, and then we have day one. I don't know if you don't want to do this the whole time, because now I've got to tell them about day one before I do the next. Oh. <laughs> it's good. She can sing. <laughs> what can I say to that? <laughs> We've been enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> do whichever way you want. But um, now, depending on which rabbi you talk to, like I say, you can hear a little difference of the meaning, but usually day one means light or life. And I'm going to have to get to my tablet because it's got my scripture verses all ready for us. So, oh, I've got to do my pattern. I think I'm going to go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead because I think really you're going to get tired of wanting to do this. Um, but I appreciate it. And if it doesn't work, I'll let you come back and help me. Um, I am going to... Nope, I've already done. Okay, I'm already off and I'm trying to find... I have this all set up perfectly. Okay, I'm just going to wing it for right now. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. And if I just did that backwards, it doesn't much matter. The idea is that the Lord brings the light to our feet. We're told in Psalm 37... Um, 23, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Lord does bring light to us, but I think that there's even a deeper meaning because when we think of Yeshua, I'm sorry, Yeshua, Isaiah, when we think of his prophecy, chapter 2 and verse 5, he said, Come, house of Yaakov, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, as we see that he called himself, Yeshua called himself the light of the world, then we're beginning to understand how he brings light and he brings life. I think both are accurate meanings. We know that he said in Yochanan chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. If you don't know what that means, that means the darkness wasn't able to swallow up. It could not take away that light. And we know that to be true. You cannot have darkness where you have light. The darkness has to flee. It couldn't comprehend the light. The light was the greater. Life we know is very precious, especially to the Jewish person. They're taught to value life above everything else. They're taught, they teach their children, you, you, they, we, we joke and we say, you know, the mamas only want doctors and lawyers. But what's really behind that is the Jewish person has been taught what you put into your mind cannot be taken from you. Everything you own can be. You can be stripped of your houses, of your goods, of your cars, of your wealth, of, of all your treasures. We saw that as recent as the Holocaust, where they lost everything. But what's in the mind could not be taken. So they teach them value life. Life is precious and pour into learn, educate, that, that this is what you can take with you no matter where you go, no matter what life deals for you. 
So realizing how much they appreciate life and then having Yeshua say, I am the life and I give you life. What kind of life does he give? Yochanan 11, 25 and 26 tells us he gives us abundant life. Abundant is more, uh, better than we could think or ask we're told later. And we also read in chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 of Yochanan, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, how can you never die and yet it says you die? Because in this one verse it's talking about the, the two parts of, that make us up. The shell, what we see when we look at each other, that part, the flesh dies. It's aging. We all know how much we're aging. Why do we know? <laughs> it dies. But even if it dies, if you are believing in Yeshua who says, I am the resurrection, I am the life, the soul lives on in resurrected life with him forever in the light of the life that he came to bring to man. So the light that freely gives us abundant life, I think, is a good representation for our day one that we have seen now. Day two, and let's see if I can get this to work this time. Oh, there it was. It was all there. I just needed to pull it down. Okay. Day two. And again, I had this all worked out. So much for technology. <laughs> day two, by the way, that, that the first night, both of these candles burn all the way down. Second night, they put in two brand new candles and they put in a third one because now they've got their servant candle, they've got day one, and they've got day two. And we always start on the right and we move to the left, just like Hebrew reads. And again, the children are taught to see how the miracle is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, some argue whether we light the new candle first or whether we go back to the beginning. For us tonight, because we're going to keep it moving, we're just going to light the, the new candle. And we're going to say that we put in a new day one. Day two now stands for reason. This is the night we're on right now. When we think of reason, reason is what separates us from all other uh, uh, creatures that God created. We have the ability to think and to reason, to realize that there is a creator God. He's given us the ability to think with our minds and our minds should guide us to the light of who our maker is. Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Wow. What an invitation. Did you just get those words that the Lord is saying? He is inviting all of his creation who have a mind to reason to come to him with all of our shortcomings, to not come all suited up, and doing everything right and earning it by merits, but to come just as we are and receive complete forgiveness for all that has fallen short of God's holy and perfect standard. He tells us that he will clothe us with his righteousness. Our best is filthy garments. His righteousness, his purity, his cleanliness, all is given to us if we come to him, come to the one who wanted to give us light and life. And that's what day two reminds us of now, that by our reasoning guide, we can walk in the light, or in the life of the light of the word of our God. Day three, as we move on quickly, stands for truth. So we light again, we light each three new candles there using again another servant candle. And by the way, I forgot to bring out, in my father's tradition, passed down to him, the servant candle was always pure white. The other candles could be other colors, but the servant candle was always pure white. When I think of our filthiness and his, his purity, again, it makes such a picture of the servant candle for us. When we have truth, it opens our eyes to light. We stumble in darkness when we stumble over lies and, and yet truth will dispel that darkness and truth will bring us freedom. It nourishes happiness. It opens our eyes and it points to fulfillment because our scriptures tell us in Yochanan 8 and verse 32, 
you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free how do we know truth that makes us free well there's another verse that Yochanan gave us chapter 14 and verse 6 where Yeshua declared I am the way I am the truth and I am the life we've already talked about how he is the life day one now we're seeing that he is the truth and it says no one comes to the Father no one comes to to Yehovah except through him he is the truth and he is the way and that truth will definitely bring one into the light that is the life of man it's fulfilling now and it's fulfilling for all of eternity because we get to go into the presence of Abba through knowing and receiving the truth who is the truth the truth literally is Yeshua that's why he said I am the truth day four falls on the hills quickly from uh, this we've got light in life we've got reason we've got truth and day four is beauty isn't this a beautiful lesson that we are learning the pictures of uh, our Messiah in this and beauty fills the spot well as we light it we remember that God promised that he would give us beauty for our ashes we know out of the ashes of the Holocaust came the beauty of a reborn Israel a land for our people but day four also tells us that there's a beauty of the Lord this is what we should seek after when we realize what he has done for us it puts a spark in us that that brings us such a joy and we should want to return to him in a way that that um, well the psalmist said it best he says it better than I could Tehillim Psalm 27 4 one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life if I stop right there you would wonder how does that relate to beauty but he told why he wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life the reason why to behold the beauty of the Lord that's sweet that's sweet but I think we often think of that moment when we'll see him face to face and there's a warmth that comes from that isn't there just like the lights bring us a warmth there is a beauty in this one who came to give us light and or to bring us to the light that we might have life if I summed up all the days I would say that he came to give us abundant life that through using our minds we come to know this truth and when we embrace this truth we appreciate the beauty of our Lord and as we embrace it we start to be filled with his light and then it's his beauty that begins to go out from us Isaiah Yeshai chapter 61 verse 3 the first part of it also says to point unto those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes even what's not beautiful in your life he can turn to beauty when his touch is upon it and to enjoy the beauty forever in the presence of our Creator for all who are all you have to do is to come through the Sun it couldn't be more beautiful than that that leads us easily into our fifth day the fifth day they say is the warmest candle that it gives off the most light and the most heat I don't know why they say that but they do and then they give it a very special meaning one that I think will immediately resonate with and that is love that's why I picked red for our fifth day uh, the, I remember all the other days except for my servant candle could be any color but on this day the day of love we realize love is the richest reward of life we value love I think more than anything else in relation to each other in relation to our God the greatest gift that you can give someone is the gift of love we see that we're told that right in the beginning in our Torah Viagra Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul this one who said he is the light of the world this one who said that he came to point us to the the way to the father because he is bringing us the truth 
He is the blood that was put on the altar. When did God give us blood on the altar? Did he come down and make an animal sacrifice? We know he never did. But he allowed his son to be the sin sacrifice for the entire world. Not dying for his own sin because he lived perfectly. He could be the atonement, the propitiation for all who come to faith by believing in the shed blood. The love that no greater love has this than one laid down his life for his friends. Yochanan 15 and 13. In Yochanan also chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 we have, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the atonement for our sins. No greater example of love than to look at the life of Yeshua. There's no greater gift that could be given and to bask in the warmth of that love, I agree. It's the richest, it's the most rewarding, it's the brightest light. And it's all brought to us by the atoning work of the one who, if you've noticed, has been serving to bring the light to others. Do you know that Yeshua stooped down from heaven to bring the light into the hearts of man. The same way we see the servant candle stoop down and bring the light into each day. Again, a picture of the love of our Messiah. I cannot imagine the glories of heaven. But I can tell you one thing. When I've been there for one second, I'm not going to leave. I cannot imagine his willingness to give all that up and come in a humble form that he might die, that we might live. Day six stands for justice. And for the Jewish person, justice is huge on our radar. And if you wonder what I'm doing, I've just broke my candle, so I'm getting another one real quickly. I always bring backups because I usually manage to break at least one while I'm doing it. Justice is something that the Jewish people have felt that has been cheated from many times in this life. And as I was talking with someone earlier this day, and there's a horrendous news story out there. I'm not here to bring you into news that, that's horror. But it is, in short, someone who took the life of um, the parents and possibly the three young children who are hanging on to life at this point. And to think that something like that could happen and there's no justice, what justice could be done to, to have one take the life of five. We would not be content to know that you live this life and it's over. There's no justice later. Would not be fair. That would be such a, a horrible, I don't know if trick is the right word, but to play on the human race. But when we know that God says there is a day of judgment coming, in that day he will mete out justice fairly and by truth. And we're reminded, our Jewish people have an expression, you hear it many a time, justice, justice shalt thou pursue. And we're told in our scriptures in Psalm 82 and verse 3, we, what are we to do? To do justice to the afflicted and to the needy. Melch David, our King David, gave us those words. Micha, our prophet, Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8 said, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Justice, day six, is really truth, day three, in action. And again, we hear Yeshua saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. And if we exemplify, if we treat all with justice, if we see that he brought truth and justice into this world, and we see it's by the hand of a loving God who will meet out fairly. So one like Hitler did not get away with it. He will suffer the consequences of his actions. We see that justice. We see the love that keeps us from receiving what we deserve for our wrongdoings when we come to accept his atonement, his propitiation in our place. We see that love of God again. We're told in Yeshua, Isaiah 53 and verse 6 that all of us are like sheep. 
we've all gone astray. You know, it's what sheep do best. They wander off. They need that shepherd to bring them back in. They will follow each other literally right off of the cliff. Boom, 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 without hesitation. God knew that, used those sheep to, to tell us about ourselves. He said, each one of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took our just punishment. What we deserve, the wages of sin, is death. Romans 6.23, but, I love that, but, the gift of God is eternal life through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. If we come to Elohim, if we come to our God through Yeshua, and we're given justice through Yeshua, we are given a righteous life forever, a resurrection and an abundant life because we've been forgiven. And he's taken away the sting of death, and the sting of sin that this world has not found a solution for. And it never will apart from Yeshua. Day seven, as we move on to day seven, this is a familiar word. Let's see, I guess I can use a yellow. Day seven stands for shalom, peace. The world rests in justice and in truth, or when it does, I should say, then there will be shalom. Then there will be peace. To our Jewish people, this is so important. It's so important. It is our hello and our goodbye. We are literally saying to you, when you come, peace be to you. And when you go, we are literally saying, go in peace. We want the world to live in peace. There's a battle going on right now of whether to give back land or not. We know that they want the peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, called Israel. But they are not willing to, have to live in peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, with Israel. As Golda Meir said, when the Arabs love their children more than they hate the Israelis, then we will have shalom. Peace is something that the world is looking for. If the world wants it, Israel's crying out for it. It's why she's even willing to concede and try to do different things to try to bring about this peace. But we cannot find it in the world. Yet we know that Yeshua, our servant, said, and this is recorded again by Yochanan John, chapter 14 and verse 27, Peace, shalom, I leave with you. My shalom I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He is our peace. And when we come to him, and we bring to him whatever is taking our peace from us, and we leave it at the foot of that cross that speaks of his love, we find that shalom. We find that he fills us up when we turn to him. He tells us, and it's recorded in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the shalom of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Mashiach, Yeshua, in Messiah, Jesus. Yeshua Isaiah 26, 3 says that will keep him in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed in him because he trusts in him. The world will know a thousand years of peace when Messiah, the servant that we're seeing here, comes back to rule and to reign and has his throne on Jerusalem, Israel, then the world will see peace. It will have a shalom, and all the nations will come up to Israel for their blessing. We can come to our Yeshua now and receive his shalom now, because he has a glorious plan of peace for each one of us, and the same way he has promised and will keep his promises to Israel, he has promised to give us his shalom. What a deal. You know, you think of, let's make a deal, and they gamble, and they hope, and they, they try to get the right door. There's no guessing with the Lord. And we bring anything to Him and exchange it for His shalom. We get the best of the deal. 
And we have come to our day eight. Let's see, we need another color and I'm out of new colors. Okay, we'll just go back. I shouldn't get so picky because you probably all want me to finish. Here's one that looks a little different. No, it doesn't. It, I, but it's okay. It's on the other side of the menorah. <laughs> Day eight, we are looking to our future. We are looking into eternity. We are looking into infinity, and I'm not talking about the car I drive. <laughs> but I love driving an infinity and thinking I have an infinite future. I have an eternity that is glorious and is it comes to me freely through the gift of the one who came to bring me life. What I'm talking about is you never need to fear the future. You may have an unknown future. No one predicted COVID. No one knew back in February when they started closing things down that it would be a worldwide epidemic that we're still dealing with 10 months later and wonder where the end will come. You may be uncertain about your future for other reasons than COVID, but you never need to be concerned about an unknown future when it's in the hands of an all-knowing God. When you know your God, He will reveal to you a future, again, guiding your every step, guiding you on the way. We're told from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, that His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts than our thoughts. Our God knows what tomorrow holds, and he's there for you already. If you're not able to sleep at night, don't count sheep. Talk to the shepherd. He's up anyway, and he's always in control. And he has promised for all those who believe in him that he would give them life and give it to them abundantly, and that he would supply every need you have according to his riches and glory. You know, if you think you need something, he's got it. Someone once said that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Okay, God, I need a little finance, financial help. Could you sell a cow? <laughs> I think he has a few to spare. My point being, his riches are infinite. The future he has for us is an eternity that we don't have a clue, but it is so glorious. It is ripe with hope. It is ripe with the same promise that God gave in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29 and 11. He said, and this was for those who had their faith in, in God, he said, I have a plan for you. I have a future and a hope. He told Israel that at a very interesting time. Israel was not on top of the world, and it wasn't a glorious day. She was in that darkness that we've read and talked about. She was in gloom and doom, and she was going off into captivity. And yet, in the middle of such a bleak circumstance, comes this bright light of hope. I've got a future for you, Israel. I have the hope, and this is a sure hope. This isn't a, I hope it doesn't rain. This is a no. This hope in scripture is the security that we have in the one who holds that future. Remember we started out with thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Messiah Yeshua is our guide and he will guide us into that future and into the eternity where we are with him. He has come to give us that kind of life. The light of the world knows no power of failure. All you need to do is plug into Yeshua. And just as this shamash camel has bent down now and lit all of these days, he stooped down again from a heavenly home to come live among us, to die for us, but to raise for us, that in that resurrected life he could promise us resurrection, abundant life forever with him. When we have that light come in, we're glowing. And the closer we draw to him, the more that we do glow with his glory. And we should be giving that out. You know where the menorah belongs in your home? It belongs in the window, doesn't it? It's to be showing to the outside world the light. As we are lights to the outside world, they'll hear and know of this love and come to the truth also. The one who gives light and life through our mind, he doesn't tell you this is, don't use your mind. You can be the, the most brilliant person on the face of this earth. 
and God is saying, come, let us reason together. Through the truth, you will find a way to, to the, the relationship with the Father, whose beauty he gives us for our ashes, who loved us so that he took on human form, confined himself, confined himself to one place, one time in a human body that ached, that got tired, that hurt, that felt all that we feel, that he could relate to us, that he could bring to us justice, which we will see one day. We may not see it now, but I guarantee you, in the eternity, you will see justice for your life. This same one gives us shalom. We can have that shalom every day now. It's not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on looking on the light. And that will take us all the way into the future, into that eternity with our God. Is this not now a beautiful picture of our Messiah? Do we not see the light of the world? And I can only imagine back in Yeshua's day when they looked at that 75-foot menorah and he was declaring, I am, I am the light of the world. He was drawing all to him then, and he draws all to him today. If you know him, praise him, and ask for his light to shine greater from you. And if you don't know him, plug in and get lit in a way that you've never experienced before. The light of the world that knows no power of failure. I have a surprise. Janet.